Welcome to The Dinner Table, a discussion with food as a lens into cultures and societies. I'm your host, Fred Opie. It's book promotion time. So what I did was a talk at my current place of employment, Babson College. We did a uh, discussion on the first chapter of the book, my new book, that is, Southern Food and Civil Rights, which looks at the role of food and social movements. And in this episode of The Dinner Table, a.k.a. The Fred Opie Food Show, because I also have a sports show, you should check it out, by the way, uh, I talk about uh, historical challenges in the food industry and how direct action campaigns starting in the 1920s helped to change hiring and promotion practices in the grocery store chains as well as restaurants. There is a lot of contextualization here in which I relate uh, a lot of movements that people have probably heard of but never thought about the food connection. And what I argue in this book is that food is responsible for the start of the maintain the maintenance of or the uh, sustaining sustaining of uh, social movements. So from, gosh, you know, you talk about the March on Washington. There's a chapter in the book on that. If you talk about, for example, the revolution to overthrow Jose Nabarc, if you take a look at that, you'll see behind the scenes that that. That movement first started with cuts in food subsidies by the by Jose Mubarak's uh, regime, and one thing led to the other. So my argument isn't that food is the everything, but it is the causation in many movements uh, that people know about, but they just haven't thought about it. So imagine this: running the Boston Marathon and having no access to volunteers handing out water or say slice of oranges, and you're running that whole meet. It ain't happening. You're not going to finish. And what the argument here is, as Napoleon says, an army marches on its bellies, so do social movements. So that's the context. What you're going to hear is an overview of chapter one in the brand new book out January 19th, 2017, Southern Food and Civil Rights. Enjoy. It's, the argument of the book is not that food is central to the civil rights movement, but just like music if you understand the civil rights movement, you'll understand that music played an important role in the success of the movement. But certainly, uh, my argument is that food, food either started movements, it became the catalyst for a movement, it became the sustainer for a movement, and it became the sustenance for a movement. So if you understand those two things, or those three things, that's the theme throughout the book. The other aspect of the book that is different from many other books you may have seen on the civil rights movement is that it's a revisionist history. Most people, when you think about the civil rights movement, you begin it in Montgomery, Alabama in the 1950s. My argument is that direct action as a strategy, which we'll talk about today, can be traced back to the 1930s and in Chicago, late 1920s, early 1930s in Chicago. So that's a very different interpretation of the civil rights movement. I would also say to you related to this work is I think it would be accurate to say that there are there have been three civil rights movements in the United States. Number one, the period of Reconstruction, 1865 to roughly 1877. It's a period in American history where there were more African Americans, poor whites, in office, in public office, than any time in American history. Okay, uh, if you think about that. 1877, 1865 to 1877, the period of Reconstruction. I, I would argue, and certainly historian Eric Foner of Columbia University has written a large book that states that. And then second, Manning Marble talks about the second Reconstruction, or what I call the second Civil Rights Movement, which is the period that I'm going to talk about today. I would argue that you have just entered to the third Civil Rights Movement. And I think that happened with the election of 2016. Uh, the fact that you have 20,000 women who mobilize and show up the day after the inauguration, that's a phenomenal, phenomenal mobilization effort. And I think you will continue to see the third part of the civil rights movement and you'll live through it. So you'll be a part of the living history and those of you who have grandkids, 
you'll be explaining to them what it was like the same way my mother explained to me. Uh, to give you some of the context about why I decided to write this is because I grew up in a house with a mother and a father very much involved in activism. So I'm the youngest of three, and the best way to explain the kind of house I grew up in is to look at the names of the three children that my parents had. The oldest child named Randy, named after A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph was the person who organized the March on Washington. That march was first organized actually during the 1930s under FDR when policies that the federal government put in place to help get the economy back in shape uh, were not equal opportunity opportunities for African Americans. I'll give you the example, I grew up in Westchester County and there was a um, General Motors plant right there in, in North Tarrytown, now called Sleepy Hollow for purposes of advertising. But in that town, those plants, like many plants around the country, as soon as the war started, those plants converted to uh, building airplanes and other necessities for the war effort. But those plants did not have uh, egalitarian hiring practices. So, excuse me, so African Americans were not given the same opportunities there. So it's A. Philip Randolph who goes to um, FDR and says, look, you better change these policies and make sure everybody has opportunity for these jobs or we're going to be marching on Washington. And FDR thought that he was bluffing and he began to stare him down and say, you think I'm bluffing? You really want to take that chance? And so that march didn't happen in the 1930s, but it happened in the 1960s to try to get, the, uh, uh, get President Kennedy to sign legislation for uh, you know, more equal opportunity in voting. Uh, the other aspect is so my, my brother Randy, A. Philip Randolph, my middle brother Marshall, named after Thorogood Marshall, okay? And then me, named after Frederick Douglass, who our president has made even more well-known <laughs> recently with his comments on Black History Month. I also say that the other context of my own life and how it fits into this work is my mom did not attend the March on Washington in August of 1963. Why? Because she had me in June of 1963. So my father went to the march while my mom was home recovering from giving birth to me. So I very much grew up with watching the civil rights movement and many parts of it come in and out of my house as well as the anti-apartheid movement. So my parents were both very involved. My mother was a uh, leadership uh, director for the NAACP in the town of Osning in Westchester County, New York. All right, so this aspect of the book is talking about hiring. This is based on the first chapter that looks at, I would say, the first time direct action is used as a strategy in the United States. And that direct action strategy comes based on what African Americans observed in India with Mahatma Gandhi and the salt march that happens. That's the first major march that Gandhi lives in in India and that direct action march. African Americans learned from that and uh, they incorporated that into their strategy and it was first practiced in Chicago in the late 1920s or 1930s. So I'm going to, I have a couple slides uh, that, that have text on them, but then after that, these are images uh, that I think speak very well of what the book is about. The other interesting thing about the book is that it has recipes with each chapter that illustrate the location and the people involved. So the chapter on Chicago that I'll be talking about today has uh, a recipe in it for gumbo. Why gumbo? Because most of the African Americans who migrated to Chicago came from places like the state of Louisiana. So a lot of the recipes are talking about the people involved in that particular chapter. Uh, and I can tell you from experience that uh, the recipes work because I've cooked with a lot of them. So something if you're a cook you may be interested in. The work that I do around food, and particularly in this, uh, um, in this particular project, is based on this whole theory of gastropolitics. And I'll give you a very simple definition of gastropolitics. Food related to politics in which hierarchy, status, and traditions are created and contested. That's the theory, gastropolitics. I find it very interesting when I ask my students, because I'm actually teaching a course this semester based on the book called Food and Civil Rights, and to ask them the simple question, what are politics? And often, students are duped. And I think a lot of people don't really get a sense of what politics is. So this is a great way for you to get a kind of a, a politics 101 
um, class and a very quick discussion about what goes on. So one of the things that we see in the food industry is that the politics play out in grocery stores. All right. Some of you may recognize some of these grocery stores and some of them may have gone out of business you don't recognize. And certainly Safeway, if you are in the South, you grew up in the South, you would know Safeway. A&P, there was an A&P in my town. There was a Grand Union in my town. Grand Union's out of business. A&P, from what I can understand, is just about non-existent around. Silver Dollar had a student from Florida who identified Silver Dollar. So it's a grocery chain, I believe, that is still around. So the second aspect of the food industry I'll talk about are restaurants. And the one that plays a factor in the second chapter is a chapter on Washington, D.C., and the civil rights movement there that happened around the food industry, and it happens with the Thompson restaurant chain. But, you know, in addition to Thompson's restaurant chain, certainly the civil rights movement and what happens with uh, restaurant chains or stores like Woolworth that have lunch counters. So, you know, the sit-in movement that many of you are probably familiar with happens in the 1960s, the direct action movement. My argument is, is that that strategy begins much earlier than most people have realized. And it happens with what happens in 1920s and then later on 1940s in Washington, D.C. So Thompson restaurant chain, you would see them in cities like Pittsburgh, Chicago, uh, Washington, D.C. Those are the ones I'm aware of. But it was a, you know, it was a national chain. So what are some of these uh, hierarchies where you can see gastropolitics actually play out? Well, there, there's, there's two areas that I want to highlight and talk about. One first area would be in hiring practices. And this, I think, does hit home with not just the, West, the restaurant industry. This is the case study I'm talking about. But I think certainly I've been in, in faculty senate meetings lately, and this is an issue we're having here on campus. So I think it was really a good idea to talk about some of these hierarchy, status, and traditions. And, and hiring practices, in many cases, are traditions. What do I mean by traditions? Well, there's a difference between policy, laws, and traditions. And I would argue that customs and traditions can be just as powerful as actual laws and legislation. Give you an example. If we were to get on the thruway and head towards um, Springfield, Massachusetts, the speed limit goes up to 65. Tradition and custom says you can go about 72, maybe 73. It's the end of the month, you better pull it back down to about 70, 71. <laughs> Because Popo will get you then, right? That's tradition, but clearly it says 65. But if you go 65, in most cases, you could get run off the road because people are going that fast. So that's why I argue that traditions and customs can play a bigger part in things like hiring practices than the actual law or policy of a company. Promotion. That's another area in the food industry will be promotion. I would say again, this is a test case, but I, I would argue to you that the paradigm I'm showing you now would apply to college campuses and other factors and other industries. Okay? And pay, actual wages. So these are things that were contested and talked about during the civil rights movement and certainly in the in the text in the case I'm talking about here in Chicago. Second, when you talk about the food industry would be occupations occupations actually in the industry. I'm going to focus in this slide particularly on restaurants because most people are familiar. How many people have had a job at some time in your life work in a restaurant? My hand goes up first. All right. So everybody in here has probably had some experience or you had a relative that worked in one. My brother went to Howard University and he kept gas in his car and kept himself looking clean as the Board of Health. That means his clothing by working at Hojo's, translation, Howard Johnson's. Okay, so these are just things that a lot of people will know because you've had some experience, you know somebody. Occupations, there's the management. Okay, who has the opportunity to actually be in the position of management? What do they look like in terms of gender? What do they look like in terms of phenotype? Skilled labor. Skilled labor, most of the time we're talking about sous chefs or chefs, uh, we cook dishwashers. Those are all back of the house all back of the house. And again, the color, the class, the gender of the back of the house is really based on tradition in most restaurants. And it's only slowly changing where if you look at some of these shows or the cooking shows, 
it's over, only in the last, I say, 10 years that you will see women on these shows. Women as contestants or women actually as judges. Okay, that's only in the last 10 years. And what's so interesting about this when you talk about gender is that in most houses, by tradition, again, and custom, it is women doing the cooking. Yet when it becomes a profession, it's men who dominate. And then if you look at the men who dominate, who gets the celebrity status, who gets the better opportunities, who gets the backing if they want to open their own place? It's very gendered and it's very much related to tradition and hierarchies that have been around for a long time. Service, the front of the house. How many people here worked as a waitress? My wife, she's not here, but she worked as a waitress, right? The front of the house. There are traditions on who can work at the front of the house. Front of house jobs are, you know, waitering, but also who is the maitre d'? Okay, who does the, you know, sitting the customers down? Who does the interaction with the customers? These are all things that are a lot based in tradition. Okay, and then what I would say, the menial labor, which I argue work all over the house. Okay, somebody drops some water, somebody spills something. It's the menial labor. And traditionally in the restaurant industry, at the time period, we're talking about 1920s, 1930s, I would say all the way up into the 1960s, that African Americans were restricted by tradition to the last category, menial labor. It didn't matter what your education was. This was the tradition. So we're talking about strategies to change some of these things. The opportunity to work in management. Ah. Now, when it came to the grocery stores, African Americans were restricted to also menial labor. They could not get jobs as clerks, they're better paying jobs. They could, get, they could not get jobs as cashiers. They could not get jobs as managers. All these things were problems and that the movement that I'm talking about in this chapter are responding to this. And that was the case across the country. It's important for me to also say, too, that there are restrictions that are what I call Jim Crow. which These are legal in the South, that that's the way it is. But in places like Chicago, Ohio, New York, these are what we call in the South, what we call the Jim Crow South, these are, these are legal policies about this. In Chicago, in New York, in Pennsylvania, these are de facto Jim Crow. So there's no legal laws that says that you can do this, but de facto Jim Crow means this is how it happens by tr tradition and custom again. And there are, there are just as much problematic because we, we often, particularly if you, grow, if you grow up in the Midwest or if you grow up in, in the North, and you think about history, you focus on the problems were in the South. I, th I think that's still the case, that a lot of us, when we look at the past election and decisions were made, we, if we didn't agree with the decision, we're blaming it on backward people in the South. But we don't want to look at the culpability of people in places like Massachusetts and other areas. That even though the state went for Clinton, you would still see some of these issues. Okay, so these are kind of the, the lay of the land. We'll be right back. For more interviews and related content, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and other podcast distributors. Also, check out our website at www.fredopi.com. Ask questions on Facebook at Frederick Douglass Opie and on Twitter at Dr. Fred D. Opie. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at F-D-O-P-I-E at gmail.com. That's F-D-O-P-I-E at gmail.com. Hey folks, if you're enjoying this episode and you want to hear Fred speak more about some of the issues we're talking about today, check out the episode entitled Black and Latino Coalitions in New York City, Parts 1 and 2. It's available on the Fred Opie Show page on SoundCloud or wherever you listen to the podcast. And it features Fred's interview with Gustavo Lincoln on New York Radio. Here's a short clip. You know, what I find in my work that, first of all, if you look at these allegiances, uh, they go all the way back to uh, the antebellum period, the period when people were enslaved, whether it's here in, uh, in North America or in, throughout the, the Caribbean and, and Latin America, including Brazil. So we, we see alliances that happen, you know, historically. We see in the Harlem Renaissance people like to use and Nicholas Guillaume and people like that that collaborated as scholars. And, and one of the arguments that I make is that the Harlem Renaissance is not a Harlem phenomena. It's a Atlantic world phenomena. Uh, but when it comes to where do some of the breakdowns happen, I, you know, I think it's a, a, a systematic decision by those in power within particularly uh, 
uh, the white political power structure that, that we saw in, in the United States, particularly when you get to the 1960s, is they saw the rising power, influence, and demographic influences of people of Latin American descent and increasing numbers of African Americans coming from the South. So we've got to do something about this. Um, you do see the breakdown that happened along class lines. It typically is upper class, professional African American and Hispanics who tend to have more of these problems. When it comes to working class people, tenant organizations, labor unions, et cetera, et cetera, there tends to be, you know, you know, solidarity. But when it comes down to dividing the crumbs on a political table, that's when the breakdowns begin to happen. At least that's what I found in the sources. Now back to the show. Let's talk about the strategy to actually change these policies in the grocery store chains as well as the restaurant chains. Well, the first strategy is what most people were comfortable with, conciliatory strategies, asking people to make changes. And I'd say that's, that's where we are right here on campus right now. We're asking people of the goodness of their heart to make changes, whether it be at the uh, division level, uh, whether it be at the administration level, we're asking for these changes. And I, I would say when it comes to hiring practices in higher ed, it usually is at the, at the division or department level what you're trying to do. So you're asking people. We have students on campus that have been asking for the hiring of more African American, more Native American, more Hispanic faculty and staff. And it's usually happening at that very local level. But it's conciliatory. Will you please make changes because this is the collective good of everybody. Okay. There are those people who, when they grew up, the thing they never wanted to do was have to call from jail and say, I got arrested. Call your parents and say, I got arrested. Yes, that's, that, that would be the ultimate in bringing shame on your family. And it's those people who tend to be looking at the conciliatory strategy to change. Because you, you don't want to rock the boat. I, I have a book that came out uh, about a year and a half ago, and it's called, it's about politics in New York, radical progressive politics in New York. And the title of the book is called Upsetting the Apple Cart. People who like the conciliatory strategy, they like it because it doesn't upset the apple cart. It doesn't get people too mad at you. All right? The other strategy that we talk about is radical direct action strategy. That is, it's, it's in your face. Now, don't confuse this with being violent. Most of the time, it's nonviolent, but the action causes a violent response to those who want to keep the status quo. They typically have a violent response. So direct action is what we're talking about here. And it's things like boycotts and daily picketing. It, it, and it means putting yourself on the line to bring about a change. It means the potential of actually getting arrested. It was mentioned last night uh, at the MLK talk of the response to the executive order with immigration that people not only participate in direct action, but they did it at airports when you're on federal policy, which means the type of jail time or the type of repercussions are even elevated in those situations. OK, but that's, you know, boycotts, daily picketing. These are all examples of direct action. Informational campaigns, actually taking ads out in newspapers, uh, actually at, at the time we're talking now, what people would do is not send an email blast, but they would use, you know, photocopies, Xerox copies and, and pass those around. These are all involved. Public meetings, actually attending the meeting and letting people know that you're actually visibly involved, that you're going to you're going to put yourself on the line. These are all parts of direct action that happen. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the grocery store business is that probably until the turn of the century, most people bought their groceries at mom and pop businesses. That's, that's just how it was done. So the first big player in the grocery store business was actually A&P. They, incre they created what we know as the Wegmans or the box store grocery stores. And they were the first ones to actually do that. But again, their practices, management, tend to be white males, and everybody underneath them ex except for those in menial labor. And the cashiers in their stores tended to be white females. Okay, so this is just like the, the process. So this is a huge change that's happening between the turn of the century and up to probably 
the Great Depression. That there's a, you would see these stores going up and, and major areas around the country, the same way you would see some of, those, you know, some of the stores that are popping up now. So that's just you know, understanding how the process and the culture are actually buying food at that time. Now, some of you in the back may not be able to read this, so I'll read it to you. It says, if Negro men can carry guns for Uncle Sam, surely they can drive milk wagons for Bowman's Dairy. That was another part of this problem in the dairy industry, in the bakery industry, the people who would actually drive the delivery trucks. At those times, those were actually good paying jobs, but they would not hire African Americans. They would not hire uh, Native Americans. They would not hire Latinos. And certainly, if there was some kind of way for them to know that you were Jewish and religious practice, they wouldn't hire you either. So just keep in mind when I'm I'm talking about this. The the restrictions were not uh, just with African Americans. But certainly their phenotype made it very clear who they were and discrimination was very easy to carry out against them. The sign about can't carry guns for Uncle Sam is referring to World War I. Okay. World War I is an important thing to keep in mind as far as historical context. That these are African Americans that are coming back from the war and many of them who fought for democracy, yet they cannot have a democratic process or have equal access under the law in competing for jobs. So that was an important impetus. The other important impetus would be the policies of FDR and the public relief and unemployment policies that were not being equally distributed. Now, as far as Washington was concerned, they were giving money to the local level for changes, improvement, and and, and, um, labor opportunities and job opportunities. But at the local level, it wasn't being carried out that way. And so the pressure was being put on by African Americans to change this. And many of them were saying, because look, you sent us overseas to fight, and now we come back home, and we're being treated as second-class citizens. 1919 was probably the height of lynching in the United States. And many of the lynchings happened by Af- were African-American victims who were trying to compete in, in things like the grocery store business at the local level, or there were soldiers who were standing up in protest, and the response to them was violent. It was a, it was a very violent strike, actually, in 1919 in Chicago itself. The signs here, uh, I'll I'll read them if you can't see the back. Uh, Safeway refuses to hire Negro clerks. Stick together for Negro clerks. Stay out of Safeway stores. So these are kind of picketings that would go on for months at a time to try to wear down the store. And the peer pressure, because these stores, Safeway, A&P, Silver Dollar, they were stores that were in African-American communities, but they weren't hiring African-Americans for anything but menial jobs. So the peer pressure... Uh, for people to see out of the stores are pretty strong because you knew somebody either from your neighborhood, from the church you went to, civic organization you went to, and somebody saw you in there. Maybe you didn't support the strike, but you didn't want somebody to see you in there and then give you a hard time about it. So the peer pressure was a very important part of this. So you had the picketing going on. Here's the NAACP, which one of the organizations, if you look at organizations involved in, in these movements, you have NAACP, you have the Urban League, you have CORE, Congress for Racial Equality. These are the main organizations that were involved in these things. At this time, the NAACP would be, most people would be, would be accused of being left-leaning or socialist or communist. So it was considered a very radical organization for its time. Let me see if I can read some of the signs here. Stay out of Safeway, it's unfair. Strike, strike a blow for Negro clerks. Uh, these are kind of the basic signs you see here. Also, if you look at the dress of the people, these were people who were either highly educated, they had a high school, now highly educated back in the 1920s is that you had a high school degree, or you might have had some college. But these were very professional people. And there were professional people who were would be able to compete for these management jobs, clerk jobs, and these you know, upper-level management jobs. Uh, it certainly was a rank-and-file movement, but the leadership of the movement tended to be lawyers. Um, there's a couple descriptions of the education of the people who ran the movement when it moved to Washington, D.C. Some of them were Amherst graduates. They're Howard University, law degrees from Harvard. I mean, very educated people. But again, they had limited opportunity to actually carry out their professions because of Jim Crow. Interesting story is poet Langston Hughes. His dad was trained as a lawyer in Missouri, but he ended up leaving the country, going to Cuba, 
and then eventually settling in Mexico during the time of the Mexican Revolution because it was the only place he could actually practice his craft as a lawyer. He just couldn't do it here. So a lot of people left because of that. Here's another one, another sign. This is, I believe this one is set in, uh, in either D.C. or New York, and this refers to restaurants. He says, um, I fought for uh, the country in Korea, but I can't eat here. So this is the kind of legislation, and a lot of the civil rights leaders, if you look at their biographies, you'll find that they're veterans of war, whether it be World War I, World War II, or the Korean War. Quite a few of them. So they came back with a new militancy that came out of fighting in the war. And the hypocrisy that they saw of fighting overseas for democracy, but yet not receiving it when they came back home. So a lot of this is involved in thinking about the leadership of the movement or the grassroots part of the movement. So what are the takeaways? I, I want to end with this, and then I would love to hear uh, questions that you have or comments uh, that what I've shared has made you think about. The takeaways are that these companies, yes, eventually, sometimes it was months. Uh, the longest one I can think of is probably six or seven months, but I'll give you an example. The Montgomery bus boycott that happened in the 1950s took 13 months for them to gain a victory. So some of these, was it was really about wearing people down and have the ability to do that. But it did force change in hiring practices in the restaurant and grocery store industry. One of the things that's interesting is that to ask a Baptist students, why would business owners, you know, dig in on this? It's just not good business. I mean, if, you, if the majority of your customers are from this community, they're on boycott, your store is empty, your products are rotten, why? And, and one of the students made a very good observation, and it's true that sometimes it was peer pressure by other white-owned and operated institutions that if African Americans won this victory, what would they be asking for next? So that was a lot of the rationale. Also, many of them were this thoroughly convinced that African Americans didn't have the ability to be clerks, cashiers, managers, or whatever. You know, the same rhetoric we heard for so long about uh, management positions in professional sports. Uh, I'm one of these people who uh, remembers a guy named Don McPherson. Uh, Ian, you probably remember Don. Don was a runner-up to the Heisman at Syracuse. I think he graduated in 87. And he was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles as an African-American quarterback. Second in the Heisman. They cut him. Because people just could not see at that time an African-American being a quarterback. At this time, people just couldn't see the ideal of an African-American performing something like as a clerk or as a, as a cashier, as a man. I mean, it just... It, it just didn't fit with them. So it's hard for us to understand the policy, but that's the mindset that people have. So one takeaway is this one. Second one, direct action strategy gained credibility. I also say to students that if you look, about, if you look at these movements, they're very much like selling a product for the first time. You have to have proof of concept. Direct action gained proof of concept in Chicago. And once they had that proof of concept, it, it took off. So that's the other thing. It, it, as, a, as a strategy, once it gained its success in Chicago, it quickly spread throughout the rest of the United States and African American communities. And it's the same thing with any product. If you don't have success or credibility, that's going to be the end of it. One of the keys to its popularity and spread is the African American media. During a time, I, I'm not really sure when you begin to see African Americans hired as reporters uh, on mainstream newspapers like the Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, New York Times, but it, it's, it's really into the, to the 1970s and 80s before that happens. Before that time, most African American communities, I'll give you an example of my father who grew up in Terrytown. He remembers in that town a man who had um, a route where he essentially would sell four or five different African-American papers. The Pittsburgh Courier, the, the Chicago Defender. I mean, just a number of these papers that would come to one town and everybody would come to him and buy their papers. So these papers are the ones that would actually send out reporters and cover them. African-Americans had an AP service that worked just for African-Americans. Many people don't know that. Another thing we talk about, the Zagat books. Everybody familiar with Zagat? Well, African Americans had a company like that it was called the Negro Motor uh, Negro Motorist uh, Magazine, I think it was called Negro Motorist Magazine, and it was a booklet 
that was created for African Americans where when you were traveling, you would know where it was safe to actually go stay in a hotel, where to eat. African Americans got it. The guy that started that Negro Motorist uh, document, he actually got it from Jewish people who had to do the same thing in the United States. They had to know where it was safe to actually go and be able to eat, stay, sleep with some kind of dignity. So the media was really important for African Americans. Some of these papers still exist. I'll give you an example of uh, some of them, the Afro-American is a paper that still exists. The Amsterdam News, which is out of, uh, out of Harlem, that still exists. So some of them still exist. Some of them made the transition to online. Certainly you're all familiar with Ebony and Jet, or those kind of magazines. But before those, the predecessor to Ebony and Jet would be just these newspapers. So those are probably the main things that I, I want to share with you. And I'm hoping that I, I gave you enough information that some questions arise in your head or comments that you want to share. Who, who wants to start us off first? Yeah. So you've been studying history and food waste. I mean, this has been your area of focus for quite a while. Mm -hmm. You've written several books. Are there things that came up in the research for this book that surprised you or things that were new revelations or anything like that? Yeah, the, the point of when the civil rights movement actually started, that 1950s is way too late. It's, it's a lot earlier than that. I was, I was very surprised by that. Some of the people who were... Attorneys on Boyd, um, Brown versus Board of Education, you could see them as activists and as attorneys in the late 1920s, early 1930s in movements in Washington, D.C. The same people. And some of the same institutions played an important role in creating these attorneys. Howard University. Howard University was integral, not only the faculty, but the students in the law school. They were very involved in this. So that part of it, just seeing these names that I knew of, but see them much earlier, that, that surprised me. That's a great question. Yeah. I have a question in terms of, like, your, the, you're talking about the African-American press, which is so, it was really interesting to me. Um, and we sort of are now, of course, discussing, like, you know, the, the different um, political leaning of different press organizations now, as well as fake news. Um, did you see a real, like, strong disparity in reporting of civil action, uh, you know, obviously, like, or, or, like, more accurate reporting from African American papers or, or under-reporting of numbers or non-reporting non from mainstream news media of, of some of these actions? So the, your question is, among the African American press, are there are those who are more moderate, more liberal, and then those are more left of center? Is that your question? Well, no, and I'm also just asking about, like, how did the African American press obviously, like, compare in terms of the reporting of civil actions as compared to the mainstream press? Like, what, like, how visible or invisible were some of the civil rights, these actions, the direct actions, you know? Um, that's, that's a good question. In the mainstream media versus the... The, the mainstream um, media, one or two things happen. Either they did not discuss this, they didn't discuss it until it got to a point where you couldn't ignore it anymore. Mm -hmm. That was one interpretation of how they dealt with it. Secondly, it, their interpretation was there are some outside influences, translation, Bolsheviks, mm -hmm. Russians, mm -hmm. because the local newspapers, which we did have local news back then, the local news, newspaper's interpretation is our Negroes would never do this. It had to be outside rabble rousers, which is interesting because during the anti-slavery movement before the end of the Civil War, the discussion of a slave revolt that would happen in, say, Virginia, with Nat Turner's revolt in Hampton, Virginia in 1828, the interpretation of that slave revolt was outside agitators from the North. Because it never could have been the slaves in Hampton, Virginia that have done that. It had to be. So it was very similar. There were outside forces that were uh, infiltrating our community, leading to these strategy, leading to these movements. Other questions or comments? Yeah. So this is interesting because technology has changed so much. So activists tend to have a, especially when they're direct and confrontational, have a very negative, or people view them negatively because they're trying to make change. Mm. So. In small towns, when they did, when the companies like AMP started to make shifts, did they hire any of the people that were protesting, or would they avoid them and just hire other people? How did it impact their livelihood? It's a great question. You look at AMP the same way you would look at Starbucks, um, Bath Body and Beyond, 
they go to Whole Foods. They only go to communities when that community has enough money to support them. So you would not see a and in a small rural community. You would only see it in a large urban community that had enough money to support it. Uh, when it happened, they tended to not, they, their first move would be to hire more African-Americans in menial jobs. Some of them, they had a no hire policy. So their first step of reconciliation would be, we'll hire some. But then people would say, you're not hiring people for you know, management position, better paying positions. And they would always write a letter first. They would write a letter and they'd say, these are our demands. You got 90 days to do X, Y, and Z before we boycott you. And once they had a victory, typically the other companies would see this and they would just collapse and say, all right, you know, no problem. At first, they just thought, oh, you know, we've heard this stuff before. They're not going to do anything. They never did anything before type of stuff. But it's that, it's that direct action in front of your business that intimidates other customers, even when the customers don't agree with the, with the strike, that brings upon the pressure. So if you're trying to get changes in hiring practices, first of all, you gotta have unity and you gotta have enough pressure that people are going to abide by the boycott of the picket. That's, that's, it's a very good question that you ask. To check out our podcast archive, suggest show topics and advertise on the show, and to book me as a guest and or speaker, visit our website, www.fredopi.com. That's www.fredopi.com. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and be good.